Welcome everyone to my Porygon follow-up video. Today I'm going to be doing things just a little bit differently. I'm going to be doing an in-depth breakdown of my entire Porygon route with no cuts. So this is actually the first time that I've ever released a full playthrough without any edits. Um, and it's actually the last playthrough that I did with Porygon. And this was recorded uh, on March 3rd, so almost one month after I recorded my run that I used in the official video. So. Let's see if I was able to finally get that sub hour time. Like, as you can see here, I'm doing everything in my power to get that sub hour time. I've named myself all single characters, that sort of thing. My poor gun doesn't have perfect health because it has perfect DVs. That's because the Game Shark code doesn't set its current HP equal to its max HP. Uh, anyways, as we go through and watch this video, sometimes I'll pause to explain one of my choices, something like that, if it needs a more in-depth explanation. And if it doesn't, I'll just let the footage play and I'll talk over it. So hopefully you like this type of content. If you do, uh, give it a thumbs up and uh, yeah, make the Geodude happy, I guess. On Route 1, the most important thing is just to avoid level 6 and 7 Pidgeys. And then when you get back to Oak, if you actually talk to him from behind, the rival is on screen for the minimum amount of frames. And this speeds up the game because the rival walks with like a ton of swagger. Uh, yeah, he's just like, he's really slow. So if you can minimize the amount of time he's on screen, it really helps. Uh, with Route 1, I really don't like to proceed with the run if I get more than four encounters. And I really like to use the Mart here in Viridian City to buy eight potions, one Pokeball, one Paralyzed Heal, and three Antidotes. This is basically all the healing items that I'm going to need until Vermilion City when I buy some Super Repels. Uh, annoying. This guy has to teach you how to catch Pokemon every single time. Pokemon, please just let us skip uh, tutorials, please. Especially the modern games like Sun and Moon, the tutorials. Oh, painful. Okay, the first bug catcher, I use sharpen three times. This makes both of the Caterpies two hits with tackle. The only thing that kind of messes up that plan is if one of your tackles gets a critical hit, but Porygon has like a just under 8% chance to crit. And so there, it's like quite unlikely that that does happen, but I have had playthroughs where I've crit both of the Caterpies and it's been like a nine turn battle instead of a seven turn battle. For the second bug catcher here, I want to set up my sharpens first. So I set up six sharpens while it sets up its hardens. Uh, basically, if you just start attacking, it's going to take the same number of turns, even with less sharpens. And then you're less likely to one hit his following two Pokemon. So that's why I do it in this order. I pick up a potion here. Actually, the reason I bought potions first in the Mart originally is because I wanted them to be at the top of my inventory so I can heal very quickly by just spamming A when I get to the bag. I also knocked out a Metapod there, and that's because I need to knock out two Wild Encounters. I am hoping for either a Metapod, a level 4 Pidgey, or um, a higher leveled Caterpie, like a level 5 or 6 Caterpie. The level 3 ones don't give enough experience. You have to knock out three Encounters if you knock out level 3 Caterpies, so that takes longer. This bug catcher, three sharpens, then sweep his team. And after that, I think this is my second encounter it is, so I get a level four Metapod and a level six Metapod today. And then I'm hoping for a Pidgey, and here one is. So with this one, I want to damage it twice, because it's level eight, then throw the Pokeball. And it's like, all, it's it, the Pokeball feels like a Master Ball right here. Like, I swear, it never misses when the Pidgey has more than half damage on it, but it will miss if you just throw the Pokeball at full health. Okay, so the final bug catcher here, this is the first bug catcher that requires no sharpens. It's going to be a four turn battle pretty much every way you slice it, unless you get a critical hit. If you get a critical hit, it's really great because sometimes then it takes three hits. Yeah, so now I've made it to Pewter City. In Pewter City, I really like to be here around like four minutes. Uh, so I'm about 10 seconds slower than what I would like to be, but that's okay. I'm also not saving at all, as you've noticed, because I'm 100% sure that I'm going to win all of these fights. Two sharpens against the Diglett, tackle, knocks it out in a single hit. I actually got a crit there, but it doesn't matter. And then it's going to be a three hit on the Sandshrew, and this will level me up to level 11. And I'm going to use one potion, because I have enough health, and then fight Brock immediately with no save. The reason I'm not saving is because if I lose to Brock, I'm just going to restart. There's basically no way to do this really fast and have perfect consistency against Brock. Uh, if you want like to feel great against Brock every single time, be level 12 or 13. That's about the sweet spot. 
it actually gets worse the higher you get because Porygon's speed. Uh, you'd have to level up all the way to outspeed the Onyx. You need 24 speed to outspeed the Onyx. It has 23 speed because you need to outspeed it so that you move first and then you can avoid damage from Bide. So if you're like a higher level, if you're like 14 and you hit the Onyx and do five damage or four damage, and then the Onyx uses Bide, it's gonna deal more damage to you if you're doing five. In this case, I'm only doing four, so deals eight damage with Bide. But I get through it and I actually split on Brock very early. Like it's a great Brock split. Five minutes and 21 seconds is like a pretty good time. Uh, I have got it down as low as like five minutes and nine seconds. But that doesn't happen very often. That was like once. And then I had like a, maybe two splits that were like 5 minutes and 13, 14 seconds. Usually it's somewhere in the range of 5 minutes and 30 seconds to 5 minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, I like to be at this bug catcher, like arriving there at about 6 minutes. So right now I'm about 15 seconds faster than the pace that I'd like to be at. First bug catcher is 3 sharpens, then tackles. If you get hit with one string shot, then you one shot his entire team because of the badge boost glitch. And then this trainer, I always use uh, one sharpen to ensure the Ekans is a two hit because I don't want it to trap me in wrap for too long. It's really annoying. Uh, conversion on the Weedle turns you into a bug poison type. If you're a bug poison type, you take one damage from poison sting and he can't poison you. Then three sharpens, that ensures that you one hit both of the caterpillars. Uh, two hit the Kakuna, and the Metapod, I believe, is going to be a two hit, but sometimes it gets, like, tackle misses, it uses Harden, and then it's a three hit. Um, and I always heal here, because this last, I don't want to get hit with a critical hit from Nidoran's horn attack. Luckily, the Rotata and the Nidoran are actually easy to take out. They're just uh, two hits with tackle each. Um, yeah, and I'm doing this fight specifically for experience. Um, this route is a route that I developed myself, and uh, then it turns out coincidentally that Speedrunner also developed it for the video, so like, we simultaneously figured out the exact same trainers to face, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, going into this video, I was super curious uh, how different people were going to approach the challenge, if we were all going to be like very different, or if we were all going to like centralize around the same strategy. And here we actually found the same strategy, which I thought was very interesting. This Jigglypuff is literally the worst. This can waste so much time in a run, and there is actually an alternative. In Mount Moon, to the left, there's a bug catcher that has a Weedle and a Kakuna. I actually faced him in the video, um, but you can face him instead of this last. It gives about the same amount of experience. That fight just takes a little bit longer, and like in, in a good scenario, like in a bad scenario, the Jigglypuff takes longer, but in a good scenario, like this fight will take longer, the one to the left. Uh, and you also have more chance for encounters because you walk a few more tiles in Mount Moon. So it's possible to get slowed down by doing that. Um, in Mount Moon, I'm going to take on a bunch of optional trainers. So this super nerd, the bug catcher that's just over here, um, the lass with the oddish, and then the youngster, then the rocket on the bottom floor, and then the two mandatory trainers, the super nerd by the dome fossil, and Jesse and James. I really want to get as many rare candies as possible. This first rare candy is absolutely key because I am going to take a page out of Speedrunner's book and use two rare candies before I face Misty. Now, that's actually something quite interesting that I want to talk about. During this challenge, uh, I rerouted myself so many times. Like, I have like 17 different routes through the game with Porygon that I tried. Um and practiced because I really wanted to get the lowest possible time. And what I found was that at Misty, at level 19, sometimes you lose and it just got so frustrating. And then Nugget Bridge was just taking way too long. And I remember waking up at night and I was just like, oh wait, that's the solution. And I realized that using rare candies earlier on could let me skip experience and get Psybeam earlier. And if I did that, I would um, make it through Nugget Bridge at a faster time and probably shave like one to two minutes off the playthrough time. And the reason I knew that that was possible was because I was defeating the Elite Four at like level 62 or something like that. And I knew that I didn't need to be that high. I knew that I could get through the league with a lower level. Uh, this fight was a little bit scary. There's some confusion and stuff there. Like, ugh, really bad. Anyways, I knew I could get through at a lower level. And because of that... That's why I came up with the idea of using the rare candies earlier on. This was on February 2nd that I had that, like, realization. I hadn't watched the footage yet, and then I watched Speedrunner's footage, 
and I saw that he used rare candies right before the junior trainer, and I was like, that's it. That's the solution. Like, I so I didn't know exactly where to place the rare candies. I probably would have eventually figured it out, but I didn't know where to place them before the junior trainer, that kind of thing, after Misty. I didn't know that. Uh, so I just, I took that from him. Um, so thanks for inspiring me um, and showing me where to use the rare candies. But I did think it was interesting that I figured out that I did need to use them um, before watching the video. Again, like, I feel like him and I were very much in sync with our choices that we were making uh, in this playthrough, except for the mid-game, which I'll talk about. My mid-game is not his mid-game. Uh, it's still different. And then the league, I also made different moveset choices. I think my movesets uh, for the league is like slightly more consistent, but we'll see, I guess, like how I do with this playthrough. Again, I haven't said if I actually beat the hour mark, like this playthrough is very frustrating. Anyways, go up here, grab the rare candy. After that, I do something uh, that he doesn't do uh, and that I didn't see anyone else do, which is I buy repels here so that I can not encounter anything between Cerulean and Vermilion. And that also also allows me to sneak around behind one of the junior trainers there. Uh, I like facing him first so that I level up for the junior trainer with the Pidgeys. Um, yeah, she's, uh, she's really annoying. Okay, so level up with two rare candies, then face the junior trainer in Misty's gym. This trainer is actually easier at level 21. Uh, I get a nice crit, which makes it a three-turn battle. Uh, but basically, if you get hit with one Tail Whip when you're level 21, then what ends up happening is you're able to take her out in three turns instead of four. So that fight's a little bit faster just because I'm a higher level. Uh, the Misty strat is basically the same as uh, it was before. Conversion, turn into a water type, prevents her from using water type moves. Then six sharpens, and then use tackle. With Starmie, you really want it to use tackle first because then it doesn't get a defense boost. And it usually may means then that you can take it out in three or four turns. So... Today I clock in at 12 minutes and 12 seconds, which is just an outstanding Misty split. Not my best, I've actually got it sub 12 minutes before, but it's still pretty good. Uh, again, you will have noticed at this point in the run, uh, my health is really nice, uh, you may have noticed that. But you may have also noticed that I've done no saves. So I'm intentionally skipping all of my saves, and the reason that I'm skipping every single save is that I just know that I'm gonna defeat these trainers, and if I get terrible luck and I don't, I'll just reset and start the run all over again. Uh, I actually never had to do that because of Misty. Uh, I think maybe before I did when I was at level 19, but at level 21, I never had to restart. So she's very consistent. The second rival also after facing Misty uh, is much easier because you're a higher level. Now here I learned Psybeam. I put it in the first slot because I'm gonna use it a lot. Uh, Borgon has better special than any of its other stats except HP, of course. There's actually a different calculation that calculates your HP because it's forced it to be higher than all the other stats. Um, something I want to mention, actually, uh, which is not directly related to the playthrough, but you will have probably noticed, um, I'm basically just doing this voiceover over top of a recording of my playthrough. That means that the stats and moveset that are on the left-hand side of the screen were actually filmed in like this. So I've been working on a software that can do this uh, can update them live so yeah those are all live stats that's exactly what the stats are in the game uh, one thing that they don't have incorporated into them though is there are no badge boosts so right now my attack stat it says it's 44 but my attack stat is actually 12.5 percent higher than that whenever i'm in battle but if i open porygon's summary page either in the battle or just out in the overworld those would be the stats that we would see Okay, so I make it through Nugget Bridge. Nugget Bridge is way easier if you have Psybeam right from that Weedle at the beginning of Nugget Bridge. You just go so fast. Like 14 minutes and 30 seconds to this hiker is great time. Again, not my best time, but it is a really good time. This elixir is super important. It allows me to skip a heal. So yeah, anytime you can skip Nurse Joy, who's really chatty. <laughs> anytime you can skip her, it's good. Um, so now coming up next is Surge, and Surge is a gym leader that I had to honestly make some compromises for. So there are three main approaches that I see going into him. One is go in at a lower level like Van Man did, like maybe level 25 or 26. I uh, use Thunder Wave to ruin Raichu's consistency and then knock it out with Psybeam. The other strategy is use Recover to heal damage whenever you take damage and then knock it out with Psybeam. And 
My personal favorite and the most consistent is use conversion and recover and Psybeam because you can convert to a thun uh, thunder type, <laughs> not a thunder type. You can convert to an electric type, then you resist the Thunderbolt, which is Raichu's probably most powerful move other than Mega Kick, but it's so inaccurate. So you resist Thunderbolt, which is great. And then after you resist the Thunderbolt, you can use Recover to heal a little bit more consistently. Like a critical hit from Thunderbolt isn't going to just like take you down to red health and then he knocks you out with Mega Punch because he outspeeds. That's my personal favorite strategy, but I ended up realizing that it's more important to keep tackle on my move set than it is to have conversion. So I defeat that guy, uh, the rocket, pick up this full restore. This full restore is key. You will have noted that Van Man uh, in the video picked up a uh, burn heal. I didn't grab a burn heal uh, because I don't want to have to get, um, I don't want to have to buy an extra item and then manage my inventory. It's like managing the menus and the inventory specifically in a speed run is like the slowest part because all of this text and everything that's going at four times speed, you can kind of just mindlessly spam through and get through very quickly. But when you're managing um, the inventory and you're having to make active choices on things that like move around and change based on the playthrough, like if you use up your potions, then everything's in a different slot uh, versus like the previous playthrough when you didn't use up your potions. Um, so you can't be as like robotic about it. And that means menus take way longer than the overworld takes uh, or battles take. So I'm trying to minimize menu time and buying a burn heal just makes me spend way more time in menus. Um, so I just don't like it. But if I pick up that full restore, then I can use that to heal my burn status uh, on the SSN if the gentleman gets me. In the Vermilion Mart, you will have seen me sell my TMs and then pick up super potions. Originally, I was just buying the potions, but the reason that I sell the TMs is because when I get to Celadon, I want to make sure there's enough space in my bag to be able to do a few things so that I don't go and do floors like several times over. I don't want to go back to a floor. I want to be on each floor once and never have my inventory fill up. So I take out the gentleman. I'm using conversion there to actually avoid the burn status. Now I mentioned that the full restore does solve that. It does solve that problem, but I actually want the full restore to solve a different problem. After that, use an elixir because really you need PP for this fight. I actually had, I lost a run because I got to this fight and then ran out of PP. The Santra used sand attack and it just like, I didn't have quite enough. And I was like, oh no, this is terrible. And then I ran out of PP and lost here. Uh, yeah, really bad. Anyways, this fight is not actually hard. It just sometimes takes a while, which is annoying. There's two different approaches. You can use like Sharpen, or you can just go into it like I did and then use Psybeam. It depends on what your PP is like. If you have a lot of tackle left over, I really like the Sharpen strategy. But if there's a decent amount of Psybeam left over and you've had to use the Elixir and the Aether, then it makes sense to just go with the Psybeam strat. Okay, this is probably my least favorite part of the entire playthrough. This little bit of inventory management right before this tree. So... I use Dig, and then I use uh, Cut on the Charmander. This is so that I can just spam through the Cut dialogue. And then after that, I use the Rare Candy, and I use it on Porygon. I did not always do that. Sometimes I accidentally spammed too fast and used it on Charmander, and it was like the most frustrating thing ever. So I, I lost two runs like that. Um, I actually completed those playthroughs, but I was just one level lower the entire time, and Surge knocked me out several times. So here... Every time it deals damage to me, I'm just going to use Recover. That's the safest way to play this fight. I actually get a little bit risky here because I go for the second hit because I'm like, I just want a good time. I end up clocking in at 19 minutes and 13 seconds. So that's a good surge. So that's a good surge split. But surge split is really hard to say. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, that's a good surge split, but it's not the best. I usually get it under 19 minutes. After that, grab the Squirtle. It's going to be my uh, Strength and Surf Mule. And then I try to cut, obviously, in Diglett's Tunnel. And then I'm back to uh, Cerulean. The way that the cursor buffers is it doesn't reset until you go into battle uh, with your inventory. So, like, here you can see it opens on Pokemon. Then I can just spam into the um, Charmander, uh, spam A. And then that allows me to just, like, cut the tree really quickly. Um, so I'm always, like, thinking about where the cursor is and how I can use the cursor's current position to speed things up. So if you can like cut like four trees in a row or something like that, it's much more efficient than like cutting a tree, using an item, cutting a tree, using an item, that kind of thing. Um, 
so yeah, like there, I cut the tree outside of Surge's gym, and then I go to Cerulean City, and then I cut the tree there first before rearranging my inventory. I'm also going to try to not, like, like right now I want Thunderbolt. Uh, or sorry, I don't want Thunderbolt. That's my old rooting. It's like stuck in my brain. But normally I would do like Repel here, and then teach Thunderbolt at the same time, because I only want to open the inventory once. I could have done the teaching of Thunderbolt back in Cerulean as well. It doesn't matter. It's actually a wash, like... Either, either location is fine to do it because the inventory is open. Um, this is really annoying, by the way, this slowpoke. Uh, so one disadvantage of this strat is that I don't have Thunderbolt right now, so I can't knock the slowpoke out in a single hit. It's very frustrating. Also, the second slowpoke, it's going to take time to knock out as well. That's just part of this strategy. There's no way for me to get around that. I could teach Thunderbolt and speed this up like I did in the video and Speedrunner also did in the video, but I think that having Thunderbolt for Lorelei later on is actually a faster rooting and a more consistent rooting because Lorelei has caused me some problems in the past, so I really just like having that for the extra safety. At the start of the game, you will have noticed that I picked up uh, Paralyzed Heal and uh, three Antidotes, so this is one of the fights that I buy those for. The um, Paralyzed Heal and that kind of thing, uh, they're really useful um, for that fight because sometimes the they last uses the Stun Spore and sometimes she uses Poison Powder. Also Sleep Powder, but it's never actually been so bad that I've had to reset there. The Hiker. The Self-Destructing Hiker. So it is a range when I'm level 29 and if I get hit by Self-Destruct like that, I have to heal. Uh, and this is... Probably the first time that he... I think he self-destructs every single time. Yep. All three of his Pokemon self-destruct. So that's actually the slowest way to win that fight because normally you can just knock out the first Geodude. It's, a, it's actually a roll. You can knock it out when you're level 29. Then you level up to 30, and that ensures that you knock out the second Geodude. And then the Graveler comes out, and it's a two-hit. Okay, so this last, I also lost to her once, uh, running out of PP. So the PP problems last. Ugh, very frustrating. So I skipped the heal here. I'm going to go directly to Celadon first, and I'm also skipping Swift. This is by design. I mentioned that in the video. Uh, I'm just going to come back and get Swift when I actually have Fly, because then I can fly back from the location rather than biking back. I think they're about the same amount of time, but yeah... There's no reason that I need Swift right now. Like, it doesn't speed Porygon up because I don't have to face any trainers other than that one guy. And I have enough PP to take him on. So here, got to get this Elixir and then got to get the uh, Nugget. This Nugget's actually quite important. If you don't grab this Nugget, uh, you can't get an extra Vitamin. And I really want all the Vitamins that I can get. So I can't actually remember what I do here, but sometimes I'll, do, I'll deposit key items at that point. But since I sold the TMs in Vermilion City, I don't need to do that today. And again, going into the menus is like the worst possible thing. So just avoid it at all costs. It's so slow. So if I can avoid going to the PC, then I will. Uh, and now here, I'm going to do some selling. So I'm going to sell like the nugget. I probably should have sold uh, this person. Oh, that person. That person is like got to be one of the most frustrating NPCs in the game. Ah, oh, she's so frustrating. So I picked up the TM for counter, and I can just sell it for an extra $1,000. It's pretty good. It'll uh, hopefully get me an extra TM. And then here, I'm going to pick up all of the uh, drinks. Actually, no, I'm not going to pick up all the drinks. I used to do that. So I guess I decided against that, because it takes a little bit more time if you get Rock Slide and then sell it. So, oh, no, I am going to do it. I, I just, like, I changed my mind and then went back on it. I was like, no, 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 I actually want it. Anyways, then I, after that, after you've done that, because you can just spam A if you pick up all of them. You can just spam A right through the dialogue with her. Uh, and then at the end of all that, you can, uh, yeah, you can uh, just like go and grab one fresh water. So I only get one protein today. And that's actually because I overbought super potions, I think, in one of the cities. So a little bit frustrating, but oh well. And then here, I've already caught my flyer. So I don't have to do any of this Doduo Spiro nonsense where I can run into other Pokemon. Uh, that's the advantage of doing the Mart in Viridian City at the in the early game. Also, the Pidgey's a low enough level, so it learns Fly right away. There's no, like, does Spiro want to learn this move, which is always frustrating. Um, that's one spot where the cursor buffers at the bottom of the bag because of uh, HM02. It's very frustrating. I wish it would buffer at the top of the bag. So then here, yeah, I can fly back. And instead, I fly to Cerulean City so many times. I accidentally fly to the wrong city. It's very frustrating. 
Usually it happens when I'm trying to fly to Viridian City to face Giovanni, and I just like accidentally fly to Pewter City. Ah, the worst. Okay, this rival is completely trivial. Just set up two Sharpens, and once you have two Sharpens, you can sweep with Swift. Now, it uses Growl twice, which is so annoying, so I have to set up both my Sharpens again, and then I can sweep. So a little bit of a time loss there because of that, but really not much of anything to worry about. I just sweep through his team with Swift one-hitting everything, and then I can move on. So, Pokemon Tower. Uh, this is a place where Van Man's strat does feel, like, way smoother. Because if you can one-shot all of the Ghastly in here with Psychic, it's just going to feel great. I actually do a save here, which I don't know if... I, usually I don't do it, and I think it's bad, but I was like... I really didn't want to lose to this Ghastly because of Confusion or something like that. And I was like, quite happy with the time that I was getting right now. Like, 26 minutes in Pokemon Tower is decent. Um, so I didn't want to lose the run, so I was like, okay, I'll just like play really safe and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll save right there. Again, normally it's like save at Surge because you can lose the Surge fight. So this is the kind of inventory management that I hate. Like, just having to go into the inventory here. So I should have done... I should have uh, deposited items when I was at uh, Lavender Town, when I flew back after Swift, that would have given me a little bit more inventory space for all of this, and then I wouldn't have had to do some inventory management right there. Overall, it would have saved time or been equal in time. Anyways, the first saves, you want to save in front of Surge, that's my first save. And then my second save, I want to be in front of Erica. Uh, but in this case, I had to insert one save, or I didn't have to, I, had, I felt like I had to, because I wanted to like be really safe. Um, Pokedol... Yep, let's get by there. Is It's a glitch. Don't do it. It's a glitch. Well, yeah, but like, also, as Van Man said, I have life equity to consider. And if every one of my playthroughs uh, had me going through the hideout, that's like an extra like two and a half, three minutes per playthrough. And then uh, you do that 12 times for one video. It's like, uh, yeah, it, it adds up and it becomes a lot longer. Especially if you have a Pokemon that is, like, terrible against Giovanni in there. Because uh, he has rock types, like Voltorb. It's, uh, that can be very painful. Anyways, uh, I also like this rout routing more. I like the fact that the, that the hideout is an optional area, and all the items in there are, like, walled off to you. So again, I should have deposited, because now I have to do some awful inventory management. The Paralyzed Heal is the least useful thing here. But I actually want it for the Arbok Trainer in Sylph, and that Arbok knows Glare, so that's the reason I want that item. Uh, but see, now I'm going to have to do the inventory management now. I probably go over and do it, yeah. So, it's actually better if you can do it later on. Like, uh, I was doing a playthrough recently, and you can wait till after the Safari Zone to do it. If you can do that, it's excellent. It's so good, because then you can deposit more items, more key items. So you can deposit, like, Surf, because you can just use Surf right away, because you have the Squirtle already. So you just use all those items right away, and then once they're used, you just deposit them all, and then you only need to do one inventory management in the PC for the entire playthrough, which is really nice. This is probably the most frustrating spot to actually get the rare candy, but I got it pretty quickly there, so yeah. And then I'm going to get the PP up here, and I should use it, but today I'm not going to, I don't think. I'm just going to go straight down. Uh, if I used an item there, which usually is the HP up, not the PP up, I usually try and use the HP up there, then the cursor buffers at the top of the inventory, so you can spam back to the bike really quickly after you go through the guardhouse. I walk here, then I bicycle, then I super repel, which is the wrong order. It should be super repel, because then the inventory doesn't close, and then bicycle, which automatically closes the inventory for you, so slightly faster. Uh, I'm getting better at these ramps. I just go a little bit slower on four times speed and then they're more consistent but still not great one consequence of coming down here so early is that the repels don't actually keep away all the pokemon because there's level 36 pokemon and i'm not that level yet oh well i want the vitamins and i want to just like get this area out of the way anyways it might be possible to do it later but i kind of like the idea of picking up all the items that i need up to this point that was that was close there <laughs> almost give Squirtle the protein or something. That has happened too. Like I've gone to the Sylph and then like bought items and then like you go to use like your first like Carbos or whatever it is and you like spam it on your HM Mule that was like just flying a moment ago and you're like, ah, oh, I'm so frustrated. 
Anyways, I don't think I do that in this playthrough. So there's a moment where you cut two trees in a row, which is really efficient. Okay, execute. This thing can use hypnosis. It's going to either use hypnosis, barrage, or reflect. Reflect and hypnosis are bad because they delay the fight. Barrage is just like, yeah, that's a nuisance, but that's the best thing that it can do. Okay, Erica, this should be second heal because she's kind of scary at this level. I'm going to set up as many sharpens as I can. And the thing that really messes this fight up is constrict. I can't believe I'm saying that. Constrict is actually the thing that I'm worried about against Erica. So the reason is constrict can lower my speed like it did just there. So when it lowers my speed, now sometimes I won't outspeed the Weeping Bell and the Gloom like this. And then it hits me with a huge Razor Leaf. Now, I got really lucky because she used Razor Leaf and then Acid with the Gloom. Normally, she'll try and use Sleep Powder, and if she puts you to sleep and then hits like two Razor Leafs, then you lose. So that's why I save in front of Erica. Uh, you can solve this problem by leveling up to 35 and getting Agility, of course. Then you can just boost your speed whenever Constrict lowers your speed. Uh, but yeah, that wastes a lot of time to level up two more times. Like you do it in that gym usually. Uh, you can face the tra trainers around her. But overall, I just don't like that. I actually... Normally, I'm gonna. I want agility and sharpen on my move set at the same time. So I would replace Psy Beam with agility, and what that means is I won't actually have Psy Beam for Sylph. Um, yeah, and that's bad. So this spot, a uh, little bit inefficient. I don't really like depositing just two items at a time. Like I want to deposit at least three. So not great, but you know I'm gonna make mistakes. I didn't talk about my Erica split either. 31 minutes and 21 seconds. That's like okay. It would be nice if that was around like 30 minutes, so like a minute and a half faster. Uh, anyways, still I'm happy with the playthrough. Like, it's uh, it's it's going decently. So this is one of the reasons I like to have Psybeam, because if I'm not level 35, then I can face him with Psybeam for super effective damage, which is great. I do take this trainer on. Now this is an optional fight, and you'll see why in a second. When I defeat him, I'm not going to level up to 35, but I want... I want agility for the rival battle in Sylph. So I'm not 35, but I have one more mandatory trainer before that rival battle. And that's the Arbok guy, after I grab, obviously, the hidden elixir. So you'll notice I used to go through the teleport pad, then come out the bottom, and then he fights you. But now what I'm doing is uh, I do it the opposite way. I just walk and I talk to him from the side. Because talking to trainers uh, sometimes eliminates the little like speech bubble thing that pops up, the exclamation mark. And if you can eliminate that, then you actually go faster. Um, again, inventory management, which is frustrating. So if you can just like use that Carbos before picking up the protein, then that'll be uh, faster because no text will show up like, you don't have any room left. Anyways, that Arbok trainer is also the last time that I would need the Paralyze heal. So you can just toss that item. It's not worth enough to save. And then I save here because this rival battle is inconsistent, unfortunately. So the reason it's inconsistent is because the, the Sand Slash is so annoying. Like, it's so annoying. It has Slash and Poison Sting. Poison Sting, again, another move that I never thought I would say is the reason that a fight is hard, but Poison Sting is the reason it's hard. Slash is annoying because every time it uses it, uh, I have to heal. But here, it doesn't use it, like, at all. It was amazing. Uh, it uses it, I think, twice in this whole... Or no, three times. Okay. So see, this is it starts to get annoying. You have to heal every turn because it's going to knock you out. Now, Poison Sting is annoying because if it poisoned me and then Cloyster used Clamp because Cloyster is going to survive one hit. It's the only Pokemon other than the Sand Slash that's going to survive a hit. If it clamps me and I'm poisoned, the fight's basically over. Uh, unless it gets like a two-turn clamp and it doesn't do very much damage. But yeah, so agility to outspeed the Sand Slash so that healing is uh, reliable. It also lets you outspeed the rest of his team even if you level up. And then six sharpens. That gives you good like uh, KO ranges on the final three Pokemon. And then you just have to two hit the Cloister and really hope. In this fight, I didn't really map this fight out, if I'm being honest. Uh, yeah, I probably should have done a better job here. But it's like, if you use like two or three sharpens and then just use Swift, it's fine. Um, now you'll notice I'm poisoned. This is why the full restore is important. Two full restores, one to heal the poison after the rival and your health, and one to heal here after Jesse and James. After that, you don't need them because you can just use the center when you dig out of Sylph. That's why I said so early on that the full restore was important. Also, nice health there for a moment. 
Okay, so uh, against Giovanni, this fight's really annoying. I think it's exceptionally annoying in this playthrough. It crits like three times in a row. That is just not fair. Anyways, what I want to do is I want to set up agility first so that I'm outspeeding. Again, it gives me a reliable recovery with recover. And then after that, I want to set up sharpen. And I want to set up sharpen six times. Now you'll notice that as I do this, I actually start taking less and less and less damage. That's because of the badge boost. It is boosting my defense with Surge's badge. So that's great because then I can get in more sharpens each time and speed the fight up. But this has to be overall one of the slowest fights in the entire playthrough. This setup takes so long, especially when it crits this number of times. Like it just doesn't seem fair the number of times it's crit. It's crit like seven or eight times now. Oh, nice health. Okay, so after your setup, then you can use Swift. It one hits the Nidorino, it one hits the Persian as well. It's not gonna one hit the Rhyhorn, obviously, but two hits is good enough. And then the Nido Queen comes out and it isn't a one hit because I'm at a lower level than I was last time. Last time I was like level 42 here, but now I'm 38. So I'm going with like the minimum possible level in my opinion, which is like just that one optional trainer in Sylph. Okay. This is the easiest portion of the game now. So I'm gonna grab Mimic, I'm gonna grab a Nugget, steal the Nugget from her desk. Yes. Um, you can also read her diary or whatever if you uh, talk to the computer. Okay, so it's a uh, up, up, down, and then to the side. That's Sabrina's gym. And you'll notice that I did not save in front of her or heal because I can just spam agility. So I set up three and then I set up, I think it's five sharpens. I might have done six today if I was trying to be extremely safe. No, just five. So this fight's free because you can one hit all of her Pokemon. Uh, unless that happens. So I got a crit on the Alakazam and it survived, but then it just used recover and I knocked it out anyways. So the only way I could lose there is if I crit the uh, Alakazam or Kadabra, they don't faint and then they hit me with like a psychic, especially if they got a critical hit. Now it's time for Koga. I really like doing Sabrina first because she feels free. And again, doing all of that first before Koga levels you up more for Koga. And uh, one of the things Speedrunner and I talked about during this playthrough when we were doing it um, was that he was struggling at Koga. And I never was struggling at Koga because I did it after. And so I think that that's why I prefer this routing a little bit. Anyways, yeah, I just like... I understand the advantage of doing Koga first though is because you get the badge boost for speed and your speed is like just 12.5% higher going into fights, which is really nice. Uh, in this fight, to speed it up, I use one sharpen. It means all the drowsy are then one hits. The first one has a chance to attack you, which is actually good because it can use poison gas on you. Um, and here I'm going to save and I'm going to get poisoned. I also experimented with getting poisoned for Erica. But again, then you have to fight trainers in her gym, and I don't really like that. So this is the ideal circumstance. It poisons me right away. I set up sharpens, and then I just like knock out his Pokemon as fast as possible. Sometimes this fight takes like a minute or two, and if he hits enough uh, psychics, then he can knock you out. So frustrating when that happens. Okay, so bye-bye agility. I don't need it anymore. It's time for Thunder Wave. And with that, I am ready to face Koga. Thunder Wave and Agility function similarly in this playthrough because they cut the opponent's speed or raise your speed. So it allows Porygon to outspeed essentially, which makes Recover much more consistent and then allows you to take time and set up Sharpens as long as you're not taking half damage every turn. So in this case, I paralyze the Venonat. That allows me to get my setups in. And I the only Pokemon on his team actually that I'm not going to outspeed is the Venomoth. So I just need to be able to survive one hit from the Venomoth once I get there. Now, Venomoth, he has good AI, but he doesn't know what to use against me because I'm a normal type. He doesn't have any fighting moves, despite Venomoth being a fighting type. Um, and then I survive the Psychic and I knock it out in one hit. So that's like basically always how the fight goes. The only way that I've lost that fight before is if the Venomoth just like gets a sweet crit right at the perfect moment and knocks you out. Or the initial Venonat gets a ridiculous number of Psychics that lower my special. Uh, that's very frustrating. Uh, and there's no way to prevent that. But Thunder Wave definitely minimizes the chance that that's even possible. Oh yeah, fun thing to note. Uh, if you swim by a guy who's on an island who is a trainer. And you go like one tile beside him where you would think he'd like talk to you to fight you. They don't. So that's nice. Um, yeah. Now today I go over and pick up this Calcium. I don't think that this is a good idea. 
So normally I wasn't doing this. I think this is like a small amount of wasted time. I have to use one more repel, which means I open the bag one more time. That's slow. I also have to uh, walk all the way over there, which is really annoying. Um, and then, yeah, like I have inventory problems again because I got the calcium. If I didn't get the calcium, that would have been fine. I would have had the problem at the secret key, but meh. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I should cut that out. And yeah, so we just saw Eradicate there. This is actually a problem because they can trap you in battle because they have great speed and you do not. <laughs> These mocks are easy because you can run away from them because they don't have good speed. But the Eradicates, they can trap you in battle and then they can use Hyper Fang on you. And if they do, when you dig out here, then you have to heal. So that was always really frustrating to me. Okay. This section is the newest innovation that I've done to the playthrough, and it, this is actually the first time that I ever did it, was in this playthrough. So instead of taking on Blaine right away, I'm going back to Celadon to sell a bunch of things. It's actually, I wonder if they called it Celadon just because it has the department store. It's like Scott's theories, there's there's one for you. Um, we need like a theory Poketuber to like really do analysis on that. How is the mineral, or no, it's not a mineral, how is the... Uh, the color celadon related to selling as well tell us that um so i'm gonna get uh four calciums and two proteins i can't take any more proteins and i can't take any more carbos so that's why i'm not getting those um and then i get calciums because i'm gonna need special moves for the league and i also want to take less damage from blaine's special attacks right now so that's the reason that i did that there is i want the stat boosts before blaine blaine was uh the most annoying and challenging trainer in this playthrough. I lost so many runs because of Blaine. I got here at level 41, and then I would try and face him, and I would always lose, like six times. And it was just so frustrating. And then I realized, what if I just use all my rare candies right before Blaine? This is going to take me up to a significantly higher level, level 47 in this case, but it's going to prevent me then from using experience manipulation in the league, so I can't prevent Porygon from leveling up and resetting its badge boosts. So that's the issue here. So paralyze Ninetales and then use Swift. I just want to take it out as fast as possible to avoid flamethrowers. Like, I don't want to get burnt. If I get burnt, this fight's basically over. I want to get to the Rapidash because here, after I paralyze it with Thunder Wave, I can set up because I'm outspeeding now. The only stat altering move it has is Growl, which is fine because Sharpen just negates Growl. So the Ninetales is worse because it has Tail Whip and uh, Confuse Ray. In Gen 1, the way it works is if you, like, or in all Gens, is your attack actually hits your defense with a base 40 power move. And that's like how you deal damage to yourself in Confusion. So in this case, uh, yeah, if, if they lower your um, defense with Tail Whip and you've raised your attack, <laughs> things get very bad if you hit yourself in Confusion. So Paralyze the Ninetales, knock it out right away. Don't want to get burnt, don't want to get confused, don't want to have your defense lowered. It's basically the only thing Ninetales can do is Quick Attack. <laughs> don't do anything else, please. So I clock in with a time of 43 minutes and 42 seconds after Blaine, which is a really good split for me. Uh, I was very happy with that, and I have no resets so far. So, so far, so good. Using the Rare Candies, or, oh, Rare Candies, oh my gosh. This, uh, this one's going to be filled with bloopers, by the way. Uh, I'm not cutting them out because I don't have time. I just uh, produced an hour-long video, and then this is another... Well, it's going to be a lot longer than an hour anyways. Um, so the thing that I want to be aware of now is that I use all these rare candies, and that means I'm a higher level, but also I can't do experience manipulation in the league. So I was hoping something, and this was a theory that I had. I hadn't tested it. What I was thinking is... Well, before I'm doing experience manipulation and it's allowing me to get to a higher level by the champion, but what if at a higher level earlier on, the amount of experience I gain still allows me to get to a level that allows me to beat the champion, but also lets me even out Blaine and Giovanni because I was facing Giovanni at like level 46 as well and he's not very consistent either. So that's what I was hoping for and I was hoping I'd get to the champion and be there around like level 56, 57. So... That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that it doesn't uh, ruin my chances because I level up like during the Lorelei fight or something like that. So I have a bit of indecision right there. My indecision was just, do I fly back to heal or do I use an elixir? And since I'm not aware of how this strategy plays out in the league, I decide to fly back because I'm like, maybe I'll need the elixirs. Like maybe one fight like Agatha, if I level up, like I'll have to use way too much PP and I'll need two elixirs for Lance or something like that. 
Um, yeah. So then I'm going to use the TM31 here and teach Mimic to Porygon. I really do believe this is the best strategy uh, that Porygon has for Giovanni. There just like really isn't anything else that it can do. And then I'm going to face what is the least consistent trainer in the entire game, I think. Uh, yeah, he's so annoying. So Swift for the Doug Trio because it hits it even when it's underground. And then Mimic Double Team and then just like hope that you can set it up. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the version just knocks you out with Slash. Um, other times you, you can. And in this case, I get it first attempt. So I'm able to set up. And once you get about like two or three off, uh, you're pretty much good. And I want to set up all six double teams and all six sharpens just for maximum badge boost, 12 badge boosts. That's going to let Swift one hit pretty much everything except the Needle Queen. Uh, you're going to, or I guess it not, doesn't actually, it lets you one hit the Persian, but not the Needle King or Needle Queen, but they're both two hits. After that, Ride On. Yeah, that was like the most tense moment. I don't think I have ever had so much adrenaline. Ride On's a four hit and it's like not going to hit you. And remember, I leveled up right before the ride on, so my badge boosts reset, so I don't have the defense boost. And then it hits me with rock slide, and like, I just, I was so scared. I was like, oh, it's over, that's it. But then, I actually pulled through, so no resets to the final rival. Um, this final rival fight is completely trivial. If you set up six times on the sand slash, you can just sweep with swift. Uh, here, because I've used the extra rare candies, I'm actually a higher level. So if it actually hits me with Swift, then, uh, sorry, not Swift, Slash. If it hits me with Slash, it won't actually do as much damage. But it actually used awful moves the entire time, and I just knock it out. So, yeah. The Cloister is scary because if, I know, no, it doesn't have Ice Beam. So, no, it's not scary. There's nothing scary about this fight. This fight is always a win. It's just very easy. And then after that, I'm off to the League. So, Yeah. At this point, I was off to the league at like 48 minutes, and normally that's when I would be getting by Giovanni, because Blaine and Giovanni both would have caused resets. I'd be at somewhere around like 6 to 8 resets at this point. But with the use of the rare candies right before Blaine, I'm doing quite well. Um, I pick up the full restore here, but you don't need to. I think I should have skipped that. Uh, if you're playing really well, like I have two full restores in my inventory right now, and if I'm playing really well, I will have tracked the number of full restores that I've used throughout the playthrough. So if I have one or two, I won't grab that item. And also then if I use, like if I go to Celadon and buy vitamins right before Giovanni, then I will pick up that full restore because I won't have enough money to buy five when I get to uh, Indigo Plateau. But if I have one and I've done vitamins uh, right before Giovanni, then in that case... Uh, I, I don't need to pick it up because I already have one in my inventory. So picking it up today was just a mistake for me because I already had a full restore. So I'm going to be able to buy at least four full restores for the league. And like, that's all you need. I think you only actually need four, um, but I buy five anyways. Yeah. So you don't actually need that full restore. That full restore is really great though. If you're thinking of training in victory road as you go through, because you can just pick it up and then like heal as you go. Okay. So I'm using the bike, uh, it's tense because you got to be really perfect with your input so you don't bump the rock too many spaces. Uh, but all of the puzzles, except the one by the rare candy, are fairly easy to get through. Um, yeah, once I actually went down. So, like, I got back here with the bike and I was going really fast and I went down the ladder and then I had to do that rock all over again. Ah, <laughs> uh, so frustrating. That, that was, yeah, I was not happy. Um, here, I don't know if the bike is worth it, but... I use it. I think it's worth it. I, it. It speeds up all these animations. So yeah, anything you can do to speed stuff up, it's good. Okay, so I've arrived at Indigo Plateau just after 50 minutes. That's leaving about nine minutes on the table to get this playthrough done sub hour. Uh, I, I cannot explain how sweaty my hands were and how fast my heart was pumping. Like I was so tense. So I saved Thunderbolt and didn't use it in Rock Tunnel just so I can use it right now. Um, Swift has been great to me, but this is the time that it, uh, we don't need it anymore. So teach Thunderbolt, then fight Lorelei. Again, I only have one rare candy, and I'm going to be saving that specifically, I think, for Agatha. So today, uh, just knock out the Dugong, basically. I set up some Sharpens, because I want, like, a little bit more damage. Again, I get a little bit of a badge boost. Uh, but yeah, Dugong. Oh, I guess I set up all my Sharpens. 
Um, yeah, badge boost. I think I level up though, so it doesn't even matter. So like, I probably should have just not done that. I would have been faster. Knock out the cloister in two hits. And here, I mimic amnesia. Uh, this is key because then I can raise my special. And raising my special both lets me survive the Jinx and the Lapras if they end up hitting me. Uh, it also lets me badge boost here after I've leveled up. And uh, unfortunately, the Jinx I have to use Thunderbolt against, but I have uh, Amnesia set up, so I'm not going to take very much damage. And then Thunderbolt, with, with full setup, one-shots the Lapras. So that's, uh, for me, it seems a lot more consistent than it did using uh, just Swift in that fight. So then in this case, I'm going to teach Psychic over Thunderbolt for, for uh, the Hiker. And I'm going to use a PP up on it, because we got to get my uh, Psychic as much PP as possible. <laughs> Also, it's important to have big PP when the Hiker has two Onyxes. Like, yeah, you just got to compete. Okay, so Sharpen. I'm going to set up all the Sharpens here, I think. Uh, the reason that I want to set up all my Sharpens is I want maximum badge boost for both the defense and the special boost. I really want to make sure that I one-shot the Machamp, if possible. Uh, because if the Machamp uh, does not get one-shot, it can occasionally use Submission. Anyways, in this case... Because I used earlier rare candies, I don't level up before the Machamp, and I actually just sweep his entire team, so that's actually really convenient. And I leveled up right after the Machamp, so then I can level up one more time with the rare candy right before Agatha. So, this I have actually arrived at Agatha at the level that I was at previously. This is really good, uh, so things are going my way. On the first Gengar, there's the possibility to lose if you're using the Mimic strat, because uh, Mimicking on the first Gengar, if she switches to Golbat, then you lose. Uh, it permanently replaces the second move slot then in that case. Uh, so yeah, that's annoying. Uh, I'm setting up here, and the reason I'm setting up is Substitute takes damage based on your stats. It does not take damage, like just flat damage. It doesn't have its own stats. So it shares your stats. So if you use the badge boost, you actually improve the durability of your substitute. And then I can use recover to recover my health so that I can just continuously set up substitute. Like I can only set it up nine times, but yeah. After that, I have full badge boosts. That actually means my special is boosted as well, which is going to let me sweep her entire team, making Agatha basically a giant pushover. Uh... Either she's incredibly scary because she can confuse you if you don't have substitute, or she's just a pushover. And today, yeah, really easy. So now I'm moving on. Uh, you can see that I instinctually used a full restore there because I'm like, I'm so focused right now. I'm just like, I gotta do this. I gotta do this. Like, I had like 54 minutes. I was so happy with this time and I was feeling really good. So I'm teaching Tri Attack and Ice Beam. Then I'm going to save. I save really far back. That's because I don't want to accidentally bump into Lance and forget my save. <laughs> so I do that by design. Uh, yeah, it's not the best. I should probably just work on getting closer to Lance without like bumping into him. I could like walk to the side and then like bump against the like pillar that's like off to the side. That's probably the best thing to do just for like complete consistency. All right, Gyarados, you can lose here. This is, uh, yeah, if it uses like Hyper Beam or if it gets Leer and lowers your defense too much uh, and then it hits a Hyper Beam, you're going to lose. But once I'm set up, I can one hit it with Tri Attack. And then from there, I have enough speed and special to one hit both Dragonairs. It also one hits the Aerodactyl and it one hits the Dragonite. So I'm moving on to the champion before 55 minutes. Now, Speedrunner got a time of 58 minutes, I think, and 26 seconds, and Van Man got a time of 59 minutes and 51 seconds, something like that. I was really hoping that I could do it here. The champion is slightly inconsistent because the first Sand Slash can just really mess you up. So if it uses a Slash um, and then like an Earthquake and gets a crit with the Earthquake when you're not at full health, uh, you can lose that way. So... I'm setting up my Sharpens. They'll, again, improve my durability when it hits me with things like uh, Fury Swipes and Poison Sting and a regular Earthquake. I want to set up so that I can one-hit basically the rest of his team members. Now, Ice Beam is nice because it's going to make the Sand Slash a one-hit. Uh, I don't think you one-hit it with Tri-Attack even when you're fully set up. So, like, this moment is where I'm scared because if he gets a crit with Earthquake, I'm just done. Like, there, I would be done. But he doesn't get a crit, so I survive, and I'm able to heal up. So I want to get the six sharpens and then uh, Ice Beam, which knocks out the Sand Slash. Then on Alakazam, use Tri Attack. It'll knock it out in a single hit. Executor, also Tri Attack, knock it out in a single hit. Okay, Magneton, it goes first uh, because I leveled up and reset my boosts. And then Cloister gets Clamp. 
because it outspeeds. It does three turns and then sets up Clamp again. Uh, I can't explain how frustrating this reset was. I was about to do a completely resetless Porygon playthrough and finish around 56 minutes and 30 seconds. I would have been so happy with this performance and then that happened. So yeah. Luckily the champion is like fairly kind in the next fight and allows me to set up uh, three sharpens right away. Then it misses Fury Swipes twice in a row, letting me set up the remaining sharpens that I need, and then I knock it out. So this next fight is off to a really fast start. But I didn't figure the thing that Speedrunner figured out, which was to boost again at the uh, Magneton or at the Executor. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not outspeeding now, which is very frustrating. But luckily, the Cloister does not freeze with Ice Beam, and because of that, I'm going to get uh, another attack in. I choose Recover. This was a really hard choice for me to make, but I really wanted to make sure that I would tank another hit from it. I do. I tank the Ice Beam, don't get frozen, and then I knock the Flareon out, and I clock in with a time of 57 minutes and 29 seconds. So that is uh, my best Porygon playthrough that I have done to date. It is the final run that I did, and I got my sub-hour time finally. I'm going to display right now on the screen some other results that I got with Porygon. These are some of my more recent results that I'm also pretty happy with. I got several sub-hour times. So Porygon, it's very capable of doing a sub-hour time regularly. It gets a 3 hours, 43 minutes game time. One reset, 57 minutes and 29 seconds of game time. Now, one thing that I should be really transparent about is that most Pokemon that I play through the game with, I do not study and work on and practice as much as I did with Porygon. So I think on like a similar level of like playing time that I would have put into something like Clefable or Wigglytuff, Porygon would have been getting around like one hour and three minutes as its time. But if you really do focus and you figure out this swift strategy, which is quite consistent and allows you to get through the game at a very low level, if you figure that out, I think the sub hour time is, is very possible. Also, Vanman has made a video about um, his route where he's talking in depth about it. So I'm going to link that in the description so you can check out his video if you want to see how the agility Psybeam tri-attack strategy works uh, because that's very different than my approach. Anyways, I'm going to rank Porygon in my tier list now and I think it deserves a spot at the top of the A tier. The reason that it's really good is because of how its moves that trigger the badge boost synergize with Recover. The combination of these two moves together allows it to get through so many fights that it just shouldn't get through with its stats. So yeah, it's a really good little digital duck. I want to play some live reactions that I had now when I finished this playthrough because I had worked on this playthrough for like two months at this point and I was so frustrated because every time I'd play it I'd get to Blaine and then I would like spend six minutes there resetting over and over again and I'd beat the champion and it'd be like one hour and two minutes and I'd be like come on like if I just don't reset to Blaine then I'm gonna do this in a sub hour time and this run had punished me so much so when I got this result uh this is how I was feeling okay uh I'm just gonna record right now because I just finished this run and uh I want to capture it in the moment I'm actually shaking right now like Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. I can't believe it. Like, oh, yeah. oh I feel like I'm going to cry. Like, I just, oh. Okay, so the process that this video has been and trying to get a good time with Porygon, it has been truly a painful experience. Uh, it's, I've been so obsessed uh, it's just like it was hard to let go of it because um, I basically found the Swift strategy like uh, like two days before the deadline. And I was like, oh, I want to use this strategy, but I didn't have time to perfect it. And so I got a, like a not very good, not particularly optimized playthrough for the one that was in the official video. And so then I was just like, I have to keep going. Like, I know that I can I know that I can perform better than this. And uh, I just kept pushing myself and like I got it down to um, like I think it was like one hour and like two minutes. Uh, it was like that still isn't like much better than my other time. Like it's basically the same time. 
I was frustrated with that and then I kept pushing and kept pushing and I got 59 minutes. Holy. And uh, I got 59 minutes in like 39 seconds. Um, I was like, that time is good, but it's not as good as it can be because I had like nine resets. I was like, I know that this can be done with less resets and more consistently. And I, like on Monday, so right now it's Thursday um, for date. Let's give you a date. It is Thursday the 3rd right now. And on Monday, I guess that would be February... Uh, yeah, on Monday, February 28th, I played the entire day Porygon playthroughs. I did nothing else. Literally woke up at 5.30 in the morning, played Porygon until like 9 p.m. at night, and then went to sleep. And that experience <laughs> was truly defeating because every playthrough I did was so bad. Like, I, I had two playthroughs in the morning where I accidentally used one of my rare candies on Charmander before I entered Surge's gym. So I didn't have recover for Surge. So I had like resets on Surge because I just kept going because I'm like, well, at least I got past Brock and everything else. Like, Because the early game is like the most unstable part until Blaine and Giovanni. And then everything is consistent until Blaine and Giovanni. Sorry, I'm like, I'm shaking because I'm, I'm so excited right now. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe it. I just, uh, gosh. Anyways, I had this truly defeating run where I got to Blaine in like the best time that I had ever done to Blaine. Like the run was truly perfect until then. Like I beat Brock at like, it was like five minutes and 10 seconds. I think it's the fastest Brock split that I ever got. It might be like five minutes and nine seconds actually. I haven't done analysis on them yet. I'll do that and you'll you'll be seeing it in the video. Anyways, I, I just got to Blaine. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do it. Like this is the one I just have to get by Blaine. And so I tried Blaine and I lost to Blaine like six times. And I have to say that was like, I just sat there in disbelief for like, 20 minutes like I didn't move I just looked at the screen I was just like why is this real like <laughs> and then I went to Giovanni and I lost him like five times and that and that was basically like the run it was done because the time was too bad at that point and like I could get like an, I think I got like an hour and four minutes or something with that run but it wasn't a time that was good enough to actually be competitive in any in any means and like I'm trying to like squeeze out a personal best from this and just like really perform the way I think this strategy should be performing. Uh, and then I talked to my girlfriend at lunch and this was the key moment where I had a realization about the experience manipulation I was doing in the league. So I'll show some, uh, I'll show some footage of that right now, what I was doing previously. So I'd previously go into the league, use a rare candy on Lorelei. That would make sure that I wouldn't level up before the, do, uh, the Lapras. So then I could knock it out with my setup and still have the speed from the Sharpens and the Amnesias throughout the fight. So I'd outspeed it and it wouldn't be able to blizzard me and freeze me. And then I just knock the Lapras out with uh, Thunder, uh, Thunderbolt. Then I go to uh, Bruno, I do a similar, like no no stat experience, no, man, ma, ma, sorry, no manipulation of experience on Bruno. Sorry, I'm still shaking. Oh. Then I'd go to Agatha, I'd use a rare candy there. Uh, and then I'd, so I'd level up after, Bru level up, after the la the Lapras, so I got basically two levels at Lorelei, one rare candy level and one level up level. Then on Bruno, I'd level up. Then I'd level up again with a rare candy right before Agatha. Then la Agatha would level me up again. Then I would use a rare candy before Lance. Then level up on the Dragonite and use a rare candy before the champion. So it's basically like the maximum number of levels you can get out of the league. Uh, you might be able to get one more if you used a rare candy on Bruno, but I was using that rare candy earlier on, uh, the three early on before, like before Surge, so two before Misty, one before Surge, and then the other three that I had because there's ten in total because I'm not going into the hideout to get the eleventh, and I don't go to the power plant to get the twelfth. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> um, the other three that I use were specifically right before Giovanni because he's like one of the hardest fights in the game, and then I realized my error. And my error is a conceptual error. What I realized is that I'm manipulating all this experience, but what if I don't need to? Like, what if just being a higher level makes the experience line up in a way where I level up on the final Pokemon of every Elite Four team member? 
And like, what if it's like, I level up after the Lapras and then I level up like mid fight Bruno and then I level up, then I can use one rare candy that I pick up in Victory Road on Agatha. And then like, maybe I level up right after cause I'm a slightly higher level or something like that. So it's like, I gotta test this. And it turns out <laughs> that is the case because this is what happened in this run. So yeah, if you like this content, please like the video, like please, <laughs> just so that I know that you like it. Um, if you don't like it, I won't make another one because it's a lot of work, um, but it was a lot of fun for me. So if you do like the video, like, please leave a comment telling me that you like this series. And uh, yeah, I'm already planning the next one. So I'm going to do at least one more. Um, and then after that, we'll see if everyone liked it. Uh, so yeah, if, if you made it this far, <laughs> Yeah, and I certainly did. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. And uh, I'll see you in my next video.